Thanks, Mark. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, you know, some of the, the, the work that I most admire going on robotics is happening right here at, at Penn. And uh, I feel really fortunate to come to visit you today. This is actually my first university talk after two plus years. And so it's very nice to, well, first in-person university talk after two plus years. So it's, it's great to be here for that. Uh, not only that, but uh, my, not only did I work with Matt Mason as a PhD student years ago, but on my committee was Dan Kodacek about a million years ago. And about a million, and one, a million minus one years ago, I went to Northwestern. And when I went to Northwestern, one of the first things I wanted to do was think about how we could do something like GRASP was doing here. In other words, bring groups of people together across disciplines and uh, form a center. So when I showed up at Northwestern, um, there were two faculty there, Michael Peshman and Ed Colgate, working in robotics. Uh, and I was given a lab nearby. And the first thing we did was knock down walls. And now we had one, what we thought was a pretty big lab for three of us. And then over the years, we've just sort of accreted. And uh, in 2019, we launched the Center for Robotics and Biosystems. So I'm currently the director of that. And it's very much about trying to pe bring people across disciplines together in a space and develop a culture where we are working together, having our students sit next to each other and learning from each other. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about the center. And then in the second half of the talk, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on my own research. Does the sound okay? Is the mic okay? Oh, great. So the Center for Robotics and Biosystems. So my home department is mechanical engineering and that's where we kind of got our start. But I actually don't have any degrees in mechanical engineering. I was an electrical engineer. I got my PhD in a school of computer science at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so, you know, to do robotics, we need more than mechanical engineering. We need material science to think about how to build soft robots, new materials, new battery storage technologies. Computer science, of course, for the algorithms and artificial intelligence. Uh, we have a very uh, strong connection with our electrical and computer engineering department, which is now separate from computer science. And biomedical engineering is a big part of what we do. You notice that the second word in the title of our center is biosystems. We do a lot with human machine hybrids. And we collaborate a lot with the Feinberg School of Medicine. So our campus is in Evanston, about 14 miles south with a shuttle running to Chicago. Every 40 minutes or so is our School of Medicine. So we work a lot with them on human machine systems. And one of the most important collaborators is the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. It used to be called the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. And they work a lot on things like uh, prosthetics, neuroprosthetics, stroke rehabilitation, and other sort of assistive devices. So they're a huge partner for us. And the, these are the faculty in the center. So we have about 12 core faculty and another 12 or 15 affiliated faculty who work closely with us, but their main operation is not located within the, the center. So the center is about a 12,000 square foot facility. And like I said, we started out with one third of that space. A few years later, we built another third of that space. And just three years ago, right before the pandemic, we kind of launched the center with the addition of a, a new space. So these people are coming from all those different departments and schools at Northwestern. So kind of a summary of what we do in the Center for Robotics and Biosystems. So we do a lot of bioinspiration. Uh, bio-inspired robots, and not just robots, but also studying animals, fish, rats, other animals to understand their, uh, their sensory motor systems and see what we can learn from that to uh, learn about robots. Human machine systems is a big part of what we do, and I'll spend some time focusing on that. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about my work in this area today, but you'll see how some of the things I, do, I am talking about touches on that. Soft robotics, this is kind of a relatively new area for us, but thinking about materials and um, multifunctional materials for soft robots. And then sort of everything else, general autonomous robotics. So like I said, today I wanna to focus more on hum human machine systems that kind of introduce you to what we do at the center and then later, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on my own research and manipulation. So when I talk about human machine systems, I'm gonna to touch on three themes. 
One is collaboration. So humans working together in close physical contact with robots. So not just you know, social interfaces, but actually physical interfaces. Interface, how we design sensors that allow the humans and the robots to work closely together. And then augmentation, augmenting human capabilities. So starting with collaboration, um, the word cobots, which you may know, was, a, was developed at Northwestern in the mid 1990s. And that stands for collaborative robots. And the idea is robots and people in close physical contact. And in this example, this, this robot called the Kinney Assist, its job is to uh, help a person recover from stroke. So here, this woman uh, is learning to walk again with the benefit of this robot developed by Michael Peshkin and Ed Colgate. And the job of the robot is basically to provide controllable gravity compensation. So when they're first starting this process, uh, they could have much of their weight supported and they're comfortable now if they fall, they know the robot will catch them, okay? Uh, traditionally, you've got people walking, you know, while holding on to parallel bars, you've got physical therapists trying to hold on to them. It's actually dangerous for the physical therapist physically to be working with people like this over and over in terms of repetitive stress injuries. So this robot coupled with a, um, a treadmill allows the therapist to work confidently, allows the patient to work confidently and recover their ability to walk in this case, to step upstairs more aggressively than they would if the danger of falling were always there. So the robot's job is either just to compensate gravity partially, or even to seem like it's not there at all. And this is a big, heavy robot. So it's, a, it's a, you know, an important part of the technology that they can make it feel very transparent. Um, I'm gonna talk about mobile cobots a little bit later. So mobile manipulators that are meant for physical collaboration. Um, but that's a second example, and I'll leave the details for a bit later in the talk. Uh, an interface. So this is other work by uh, Ed Colgate and Michael Peshkin. We've all got one of these in our pockets, right? Um, but the way we interact with it is by looking at it and using our fingers and sort of visually guided interaction with the image on the screen. So what they're working on is allowing you to create a sense of touch on the glass surface of a phone so, or, or any touch screen. So the idea is that you know, as you're touching your screen here, you can actually use electroadhesion. So as you move your, you run your finger over the glass screen, you can selectively turn on electroadhesion, pulling the finger against the screen and letting go. And if you do that rapidly, as the finger slides over, then you perceive that as a texture. So now you can do things like feel bumps on your screen. You can feel different kinds of textures. And so you can imagine even, you know, using your phone while it's still in your pocket, just by a sense of touch. Another example of interface is soft electronics, stretchable electronics. So this is work by John Rogers. Um, so in this example here, it's somebody who suffered a, uh, a transhumeral amputation and now is going to be outfitted with an intelligent prosthetic, an advanced prosthetic. So one thing you wanna do is you might wanna get EMG signals from their residual arm here and use those EMG signals to control the prosthetic in an, an intuitive way. So what John and his collaborators have shown is that you can create electronics that are stretchable, conform to the surface of the skin. They're wireless, they can be powered externally, and then they can be disposed of. So very easy to apply, does not change the skin properties much, uh, and inexpensive so that can be um, you know, just thrown away when you're, when you're finished using it. Not only sensing, but also actuation is possible. And that is not my, <laughs> did I say remind later? I think I can do that. It's not showing up on my screen. Maybe I have to use, maybe I have to use the other keyboard or I could just ignore it. This, this one. Remind later. Thank you. Um, other applications beyond robotics, of course, this is a high impact one. Um, when you have a, a, a premature baby that needs to stay in intensive care for an amount of time before going home with the parents, you need to monitor that baby. 
And usually that means you've got wires attached to them. It prevents the mother or father from picking up the child and holding the child. And uh, they know that this sort of skin to skin contact is very important for the development uh, of, of babies. So one thing they've shown is that they, in this case, um, they create an electrocardiogram sensor that's just the skin based or the skin like material. They can apply it to the baby's chest and get rid of all those wires. Now they can monitor it by holding a, a sensor up close to the baby's chest and still allow the parents to interact with the child. Augmentation, <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this work by Todd Kaikin. And now this is about 12 years ago now, so it's a little bit dated, but I think it's a great example of what you can do when you combine you know, robotics with the power of the medical school and the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. So this is intuitive uh, arm prosthetic control by targeted muscle re -innervation. So here's a normal musculature of the chest and the arm. Uh, after, and then to control the muscles of your arm, you've got nerves running down to your arm that you're controlling through motor cortex. Uh, but after amputation, those nerves are severed along with the rest of the arm. And now what we'd like to do is outfit this person with an advanced prosthetic so they can control it with a sort of brain machine interface. So what you can do after the amputation is you can perform this surgery called targeted muscle re where you basically take those nerves and you re-implant them into healthy muscle. Okay, so now, you know, if you can, you know, flex the muscles of your chest, you know, maybe you have some limited control, but once these nerves have been retargeted into the chest, they can grow into the chest, re it. And now you can get very fine control of the chest motion using the same nerves that you used to be using to control your arm. So now as the nerve regrows into the muscle, the, the electrical signals that you're sending down those nerves are amplified. And now they're large enough that they can be picked up by surface EMG electrodes. And so now the idea is you think about using those nerves that used to control your arm and that will cause flexing of the chest muscle, pick those up with surface EMGs, and then you use that to control a prosthetic arm. Okay, so now, you know, the, the learning of how to use a prosthetic is easy, because you just try to remember back to what it was like to control your own arm. So here's a video um, of one of the users. Now she's had a transhumeral amputation, not at the shoulder. Uh, and then, so she's had the, the, the uh, targeted muscle re happening at the triceps and the biceps. But here you can see that she's using this highly articulated prosthetic arm pretty dexterously uh, just by thinking about controlling her arm. Now, one of the interesting things about this too, there's a side benefit that uh, people experience the phantom limb effect. You know, if they've had an amputation, they may still feel pain at their fingers or something, which they don't have anymore. By re-implanting re these nerves into muscle, you can get rid of that pain. Basically, it has, the nerves have now have something to do. Um, and the other thing is that those same nerves that you're using to control the muscles of the arm are also carrying sensory signals back. So if you were to tap somebody on their chest at the right location, they may sense it like you're tapping their finger. So if you can give that prosthetic arm tactile sensors, take the data from there and turn it into sensations at the chest. Now they can feel what's happening with their hand, not just control it. Another uh, example of augmentation that I've worked on with uh, collaborators at Case Western Reserve is called a functional electrical stimulation neuroprosthetic. So this is for people who suffered a spinal cord injury, not had a you know, mechanical amputation, so they still have the hardware, but they've lost the connection from the motor cortex to the muscles that control the arm. So uh, with surgeons at the FES Center in Cleveland, you can do a surgery where you implant a stimulator pack in the abdomen. And that stimulator pack goes to stimulate the muscles of the arm and the chest and the back. And that can cause the, the patient's arm to move. And now the idea, if we can connect that with some sort of um, brain machine interface that takes what they're thinking about, what they'd like to do with their arm, 
bypass the break that they have there, the, the, the cut in the, in the spinal cord. Now that we hope to restore the ability of people who have high spinal cord injury to do simple tasks as daily living, like reach out and grab a piece of food and feed themselves. So these people are very reliant on their, uh, on their caregivers. So any amount of autonomy that we can give them is a big win. So this is a video of one of our patients uh, who's had the surgery. And what I'm not gonna talk about is the brain machine interface. Right here, the brain machine interface really consists of eye tracking to see where they're looking. And then it's very simple, low bandwidth EMG control at the neck where they still have voluntary control. And then basically using that when they focus their eyes on some object in the world and then trigger, your arm will reach out and grab the thing that they're looking at. So here what's happening, so I'm not gonna talk about that. I guess I just did talk about that. I'm not gonna talk more about it. But uh, what I'm gonna talk about now is the uh, process of calibrating this system that figures out how to stimulate the muscles so that the arm will follow the desired trajectory. So what you're seeing here, uh, she's been attached to a robot and the robot is basically moving her arm around. At the same time, we're stimulating her muscles with the stimulator pack. And then from that, we're building up, we're basically doing system identification. We're understanding how the stimulations correspond to uh, muscle forces and torques. And then we can use that same model in control. So uh, here she is detached from the robot arm. And the task here is just emulating, reach out, grab something and bring it close to the mouth. So the model that was trained during experiments like you see in the bottom left is now being used in the top right just to stimulate the arm to uh, follow a desired trajectory. And because of a number of technical reasons, the update rate for the stimulation is only 13 times a second. So if you've ever tried to control a robot at 13 Hertz, it's hard to get very smooth control. So you can see there's some jerkiness here, um, but you basically, you get the idea of what we're trying to achieve. So uh, these examples are a sort of a, a summary of what we're doing in the center and human machine systems. And the reason I highlight these is because it kind of highlights our interaction with the medical school and the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Also of those 12 faculty that I showed you, almost all of them have some hand in human robot systems. Uh, for the remainder of my talk, I want to uh, talk about some of my own work in robot manipulation, starting with this collaborative manipulation, just picking up on that theme and then going from there into uh, autonomous manipulation. Okay, so this is a uh, multi-robot cooperative manipulation system. Uh, this is a group in Germany led by Sandra Hirsch, and they've got three mobile manipulators here, omnidirectional bases with these panda robot arms that some of you might be familiar with, and they're collectively manipulating a rigid body. So um, very interesting system, but there's also some issues here. One is that if you know the Panda robot, then its impedance control is all based on closed loop control. It does it quite well, but the fact is, you know, once there's a, a displacement to the robot end effector, there is some finite bandwidth to respond to that, right? So if you have a fragile object that they're carrying together, there, this is a mechanically over-constrained system, right? You've got too many control degrees of freedom uh, trying to control this six degree of freedom object. And because of that, you could damage it if, you're not, if you don't have any sort of pa passive compliance. Okay, so I just want to show you uh, our system. Um, this is sort of hot off the press. We call it the Omnid. It's not very creative, but maybe it's sort of for hominid or maybe it's for omnidirectional delta platform. But the point of this system is to allow multiple robots to help us manipulate some large, heavy or unwieldy body. I'm gonna tell you more about the details, but um, just so that the video makes sense, this is what each robot looks like. So there's again, a three degree of freedom, mechanum wheel omnidirectional base. And then there's a six degree of freedom robot arm or uh, delta manipulator where three of the degrees of freedom are actively controlled. So it controls X, Y, Z motion. And three of the degrees of freedom, the rotation at the gimbal are passive. So freely rotating. 
instrumented, but not controlled. So essentially what this robot is doing is applying forces in X, Y, and Z at the end effector. And those forces are, we also have compliance there. So each of these, let's see down here, each of these uh, joints is a series elastic actuator. So we've got built-in compliance and we're doing control of three degrees of freedom actively at each point. So that means we need more than one to control a rigid body. So this is a video of it in action. So the, I'm sorry, it's a little bit jerky here, but the problem is to uh, take this kind of unwieldy large load, which weighs about I don't know, 23 pounds or so, and do six degree of freedom manipulation, in this case, inserting this pipe assembly into a fixture. So the video is a little bit jerky, but what I want you to do in the next scene is just see how smooth the motion is of the object, even if the, the robots themselves, even if the mobile bases are a little bit jerky, uh, it's very easy for the operator to uh, manipulate this object. So yeah, sorry, the, the low frame rate here kind of <laughs> hurts the ability to see the smooth motion. But the point is from the, the manipulator or the human's point of view, the robot is like a weightless rigid body, or sorry, the object is like a weightless rigid body. All the robots are doing are moving around to achieve that effect for the, for the human. So you can do this yourself. You can do this kind of manipulation, but holding onto this heavy thing is kind of awkward to do. And the robots just uh, get rid of all gravity for you. Okay, we call these uh, mobile collaborative robots or MOCOBOTS for short. Um, but the idea behind it is we're going to decouple the locomotion from the manipulation. Okay. So we're going to assume that our, our mobility base is kind of low bandwidth motion control. We're not going to ask much from it in terms of you know, high fidelity control. We just want it to be able to move around. So it could be a... Uh, it could be a mechanum wheel omnidirectional base like I just showed you, or maybe it could be a legged robot. Um, but then when we mount the manipulator on top of it, we want the manipulator to be able to decouple the forces that it applies at the object from the sort of gross motion happening at the mobile base. So low bandwidth motion controlled mobility, but high bandwidth force controlled manipulation. And we also want this passive compliance to make sure that we're not, you know, if we're manipulating fragile objects, we're not, uh, we're not going to be damaging um, the object based on sort of finite bandwidth closed loop control. So uh, this is just a, a simple control block diagram to give you an idea. Up here, the force control is happening. And then down here is where the motion control is happening. And really, you can think of what's happening up here, the, for, the compliant force control as being what the object sees. And then down here, the motion control for the manipulator, it's only job, or for the mobile base, it's only job is to keep the manipulator in the center of its workspace. Okay, so as we start to run out of workspace, move so the manipulator can maintain its control authority. So uh, again, this is, the, this is how we achieve it here. Um, the, uh, the fact that the series elastic actuator can only provide forces in the same direction that it's providing passive compliance ensures that when you hook a lot of these things up to the same object, that we're not in danger of damaging them. It also means that we need at least three, three of these to control a rigid body. So if you think about it, each one of these is controlling a for, compliantly controlling a force. So if I've got one here and one here, I can take the axis through those two points and there's nothing prevent, preventing free rotation about that axis. So I need at least three of them. Um, but I can also do manipulation of uh, articulated bodies or flexible bodies. So uh, I don't know if this is going to play any smoother, but you can see that the, the motion of the, well, I guess not, it's too jerky, but the motion of the object is very smooth, even if the wheeled manipulators underneath are kind of start stopping and starting. And that all happens because of the decoupling from the mo between the motion control and the force control of the manipulator. So some things we want to do in the future, we want to be able to do payload impedance and force control for assembly. So what I'm showing you here is basically the human, you know, freely moving the object around. And you can imagine like, you know, in the future when we're constructing Mars habitats, you know, we'd like to have you know, walking robots up there that can help us help the human perform 
these kinds of assembly tasks, maybe put a solar panel onto a habitat uh, without the human having to worry about breaking it or you know, trying to control the entire weight themselves. So when we're doing that assembly, we might wanna control the forces and torques on the payload, not just at the control point. And so that's something for cooperative control between the robots. What you saw before in this video, um, there's no communication between the robots. There's no coordination. Each one of them individually is just supporting the weight that they have. Uh, and that together allows this kind of free motion. But now when we're trying to do cooperative force control, there needs to be some coordination between the manipulators. Uh, we'd also like to do multi-human, multi, -human, multi so we don't have to have just one human. If we've got an object with many degrees of freedom or a flexible object, we can have more than one human attached to it. And then they would be sort of directing the configuration they want the object to take. And the robots would just, would just be supporting that. Uh, we'd also like to do continuous estimation of payload properties and human intent. So if we take a bunch of these robots and we attach them to a, a load, we'd like them to be able to figure out what that load is, what are its mass or inertial properties, um, maybe it's, it's, it's uh, springiness or compliance properties. And we'd also like the robots to know where humans are contacting it. Okay, so if a human comes up and starts grabbing it here, let's go, and then goes over and grabs it there, the robot should be able to continuously estimate that. And then finally, we do a lot of work in uh, swarm robots, which I'm not going to talk about today. But this is not just a system for human assist. Obviously, the robots themselves can perform autonomous manipulation. Okay, so that leads me into autonomous manipulation. And um, a lot of my work historically has been on what we call non prehensile manipulation. So this is manipulation without grasping. Um, and so the reason we're interested in manipulation without grasping is that you can control degrees of freedom of an object that the robot itself does not have. So in this left example here, there's three wa or sorry, four washers sitting on top of a vibrating plate. So that vibrating plate is moving with six degrees of freedom. And if you're grabbing onto an object and moving it around, you'd be limited to controlling six degrees of freedom of the object. But if you allow relative motion between the object and the plate, like you see in the left example there, those washers have each three degrees of freedom, technically X, Y, theta in the plane. And you could potentially control all 12 degrees of freedom of those four washers with only six degrees of freedom of the, uh, of the vibrating plate. So this is achieved by friction and by allowing relative motion. In this case, the relative motion is sliding. Uh, on the one on the right, the relative motion is rolling. So that's another way to achieve motion between, actually this one's rolling and free flight. Both of them are allowing relative motion between the manipulator and the object. So we call this contact juggling. So this is kind of in, in contrast with juggling where you're throwing and catching. Contact juggling is when you're like rolling a crystal ball on your hand, for example. And so this is just a, uh, a robotic implementation where if you know something about the differential geometry of the surfaces and contact and you can do feedback control, then you can control the, the relative rolling motions. So that's non-prehensile manipulation. More recently, we've also been looking at prehensile manipulation, and in particular, in-hand manipulation. So now we have a firm grasp of the object, but we're still allowing relative motion between the manipulator and the object. Uh, and that's called in-hand manipulation. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that second example. So first thing to know, so we're talking about multi-degree of freedom, robot hand, multi-fingered hand, and we're gonna try to manipulate objects, and those objects might come in contact with the environment. So if any of those objects or the environment are rigid, now we have to worry about having compliance at the fingers themselves or at the, at the hand itself. So we need compliance. Every robot is compliant in some way, right? Sometimes it's compliant just because you tried to design it as stiff as you can, but it's not infinitely stiff. So you run a robot into the wall, the robot you know, is going to give because it doesn't have enough strength to push through the wall. So that's kind of unavoidable or unintentional compliance. We're more interested in designed compliance, so we can reason about the forces in contact. Uh, you can get that using passive compliance. So in other words, 
if the manipulator itself has flexible joints or has some has some pat or some uh, stiffness at its sorry flexible links or stiffness at its joints, then you're going to get compliance at the end effector, but it's going to be hard to characterize. I want to talk more about passive but simply characterized compliance because we can use that more effectively in planning manipulation. Uh, we also have other kinds of uh, compliance like uh, variable compliance or variable impedance actuators and active compliance control. But again, this requires feedback control to maintain the compliance as opposed to uh, just the mechanics. Okay, so here's an example of an in-hand sliding regrasp. So if you ever use chopsticks, when you pick them up, typically the ends are not perfectly aligned and they're very difficult to use in that case. So oftentimes the first thing you'll do is you'll use a contact constraint and you'll push the chopsticks against the constraint and now you've aligned them. Right. So this is the kind of in-hand sliding manipulation or sliding regrass problem that we're interested in. Um, so I'm going to give you a very simple model of this and then see how we can extend it later. So <clears throat> imagine that the fingertip is connected to an anchor, so this finger anchor, by a spring, a multidimensional spring. And we're going to position control that anchor. And this spring is then it can control the compliance between the fingertip and the object. And as a simple model, assume Coulomb friction between the fingertip and the object as we slide. So now the control for this fingertip is to position control the anchor. And that's a good model for, you know, if you've got, you know, highly geared joints, like I've got you know, fingers with 300 to one gear ratios you're probably doing something more like position control at the fingers than you are doing um, uh, force control. But then you have this compliance built in that will give you the, uh, the compliance you need between rigid objects. Okay, so here's an example of regress problem. So this is a four finger Allegro robot hand. And the problem here is very simple. We're grasping onto uh, a rigid body. The fingers are at the top and I wanna slide them to the bottom of the object without the object moving. So the way to think about this in our model is we've got anchors connected to the fingers. We're gonna position control the anchors and the passive, the passive uh, stiffness is going to cause the motion of the fingers over the object. We're starting at this initial configuration. We wanna achieve this desired configuration. So the problem is to move from this initial grasp down to the goal grasp while ensuring quasi-static balance. So we don't want to, the object to fall over, for example. So the problem now is you've got a set of finger contacts on an object, a set of contacts between an object and, a, and a, an external environment. And what you wanna do is solve for the forward mechanics that tell us, you know, if I move the fingers, anchors like this, this is how the fingertips will move on the object the inverse mechanics that tells us uh, if I want the fingertips to slide like this, this is how I should move the anchors. And then use both of those for motion planning and control of the, of the regress. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk in great detail, but let me just give a flavor of that. So if you imagine that there's a fingertip in contact with a flat surface and this circle up, oops, this circle up here is the anchor. Then if we're assuming Coulomb friction, then we can draw this three-dimensional cone that tells us if the anchor is anywhere inside of this cone, the fingertip is going to stick. Basically, as I move the anchor down closer to the fingertip, the springs compress, the normal force gets larger. And as I move the anchor to the left or right, the tangential force gets larger. And when I move it to the edge of this cone, then the finger begins to slide. Now, if I wanna solve the inverse mechanics of sliding, if I say I want the fingertip to slide in this direction at this speed over the, over the surface, then it turns out there's uh, many solutions to the motion of the anchors that will solve that problem. So first of all, the anchor has to get to the edge of the cone. And then I, can, uh, I, can, I need to apply this, this specific, or this general solution with any of these normal uh, velocities. So 
as long as I'm moving in this direction, the finger is going to slide. And then I can add to it any component in this uh, orthogonal direction. And all that component will do is change what the rate of change of the normal force at the contact is. So basically, if you just tell me the direction you want to slide, uh, then you also need to resolve that by telling me how you want the normal force to change. And then I can come up with a specific solution to the finger anchors. So this is just a simple example to give you an idea of what's behind the mechanics, but I won't go into all the details. And I won't talk about this much, but the motion planning problem is basically move the fingers from the start to the goal location while maintaining a quasi-static grasp at all times using the mechanics that we've solved. So for this example, um, if we only control the Y positions of the fingers, um, this space here, which is parameterized by the Y position of the left finger and the Y position of, of the right finger, tells me that as long as the fingers locations are inside this green area, then the quasi-static balance constraints are satisfied. And so the motion planning problem starts with the fingers are in contact, the contact forces are inside their friction cones at the contact. And phase one is to move the anchors so that the, that the contact forces hit the edge of the friction cone and then the sliding can commence. So in phase one, we're just repositioning the anchors to change the contact forces, but not change the contact locations. And then you enter this sliding phase where you move from the start configuration to the, the final grasp. And if you wanna make this as robust as possible, you try to stay on that red line that's kind of near the center of that green region. If you ever go and touch the gray region, um, the object will lose quasi-static balance. So this is just a video of that. We start with the sticking phase. It's hard to see here, but the contact forces, these blue lines are hitting the edges of the friction cone while you reposition the anchors. And now as the fingers slide over, contact forces are always on the edge of the friction cone. This is the actual motion. And here it is superimposed on the plan that we came up with. So we implemented this using active feedback control of the stiffness of the fingertips. But like I said, the Allegro hand that we're using has highly geared actuators and active, active stiffness control does not work that well. So the next step in this work was to de develop better fingertips. And what we want for fingertips to use this kind of motion planning and control technique that I mentioned for three-dimensional sliding regrasp is we wanna understand what the compliance is. We wanna have well-characterized compliance, not the sort of lousy compliance that we get by feedback control. Uh, we wanna be able to do contact point detection. Where are we making contact with the object as we manipulate it? We wanna be able to measure the wrenches. So what are the forces and torques being applied at the fingertips? And ideally we would like the fingertips to be low cost. Now we spent uh, the better, well, more than a year really, experimenting with uh, Syntouch Biotac fingertips. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with these, but these are sort of bio-inspired fingertips that you can buy that cost more than $5,000 each. And while they have some nice features, they are certainly terrible at providing force feedback. It's very difficult to measure forces out of the information that's coming from them. Um, and this is something we really wanted. Uh, we also looked at other fingertips that exist currently, and we did not want to get into the designing a tactile fingertip business, but that's what we ended up doing, just because we could not find uh, what we needed on the market. So we started designing compliant tactile fingertips. Again, we want well-characterized compliance. We want to be able to detect contact points. We want to be able to detect the wrenches, and we want low cost. So this is the Allegro hand with the very first tactile fingertip that we developed. So these are the fingertips that come with it, kind of hemispherical uh, at the end of the finger, but most manipulation happens on your finger pad here. So we designed it so that the hemisphere here is uh, coming out towards the object being grasped. Okay, so, and this is a picture of that tactile sensor. So like many others, it is uh, based on an optical camera. So the left is the sort of very simple schematic of it. 
we have the manipulation surface, which is a, a dome. And it's designed that way because we're interested both in sliding and also rolling manipulation. So if you have a flat tactile sensor, it's not gonna be very good for rolling. So it's designed to be a dome and inside that dome is an acrylic waveguide. So basically we're injecting light into the waveguide. And then when there's contact on the silicone cap, that causes a frustrated total internal reflection. So the light that had been passing through the waveguide now gets uh, diverted down to the camera below so we can visualize the contact location. And at the same time, that LED board that's providing light up into the dome is also got fiducials facing downwards. And we use the motion of those fiducials to tell us how that dome is moving because it's compliantly connected to the base by a spring. In this case, it's a very simple um, compression spring attaching the distal part to the proximal part of the fingertip. Um, there's lots of uh, optical tactile sensors out there. Probably people are most familiar with the gel sight and the gel slim out of MIT. Um, our work was actually most inspired by a work that came out of Japan back in the early 90s. Uh, and then the OptoForce, which is a technology where uh, reflected LED light was picked up to determine three-dimensional forces on an object. So um, this just shows you how it works. Uh, so these are the fiducials. The camera is at the bottom part, looking up at the fiducials. As the fiducials move, we're using the motions to reconstruct the three-dimensional configuration of the dome. So on the left, you see what the camera sees. On the right, you see its reconstruction. <clears throat> so this is important because that flexure is giving us compliance, but that also means that unless we know how the dome is moving, we don't know where in space the contacts are. So we allow this dome to uh, deflect up to three to five millimeters. So as it deflects, we're getting the position of the dome, then we get the contact on the dome, and from that we can get the contact location in three-dimensional space. And not only that, if we're getting the deflection and we have a well-characterized flexure, then we can get the, the wrenches that are being applied to the dome. The forces are only allowed to pass through the dome, no other places. So all of those forces and torques are being picked up as displacement of the dome. Um, so this one's just demonstrating contact location sensing. So here, just poking on the, uh, on the fingertip and you see the light, the, the light being reflected inside in the middle image. And then on the right, you can see the reconstruction of the contact points. Um, I'm not gonna say much about the theoretical stiffness. There's lots of ways that you could design, uh, design the flexure. Uh, the simplest one that actually works quite well for us is just to have a single helical spring. Uh, it's very easy to design, very easy to replace. So if I have a very strong robot hand, I'm gonna want a stiffer spring there so I can get the maximum um, sensing range out of it. And if I have a weaker hand, I'm gonna replace it with a, a less stiff spring. Um, and then, you know, if we have a, a, a specification, like we wanna be able to sense 10 Newtons of compressive force in the normal direction when the, uh, when the spring is displaced by uh, two and a half millimeters, then we can choose a spring that will give us approximately that, that stiffness. So here's just an example. If we chose the spring that's shown there, it's gonna predict the stiffness matrix that relates basically angular motions and linear motions of the dome to forces and torques or wrenches on the left side. So we're looking for approximately um, 4,000 as the number in our bottom right to get the right uh, value of stiffness for our current Allegro hand. Um, lots of ways you could design parallel flexures. You know, the, the simple spring I showed on the left is one. On the right shows an example with three springs. And uh, basically the more springs you have and the more geometric parameters to design where they, they fit, the more freedoms you have to control the, um, the degrees of freedom of that stiffness matrix. Um, testing rig, we put this thing into a, uh, a very high resolution uh, motions uh, resolved to within a micron. Uh, 
five degree of freedom rig. And now as we move it along around, we're testing the, we're measuring the forces with this ATI nano. And then from that, we get a very good cal calibration of the, the, the springs properties. The other thing about using a metallic spring instead of some kind of elastomer or gel is that we get rid of hysteresis. And this is very important, right? Um, if we've just got some kind of soft, soft uh, plastic in between the, uh, the proximal piece and the distal piece, then we're not gonna get uh, good, good hysteresis or creep uh, performance. Um, so just an example of contact location sensing. Uh, we put this cap on top of the dome. Uh, we poke, poke the dome several times uh, along every hole in this cap. And then we find out that we get average contact location error of uh, less than a millimeter. And by the way, the size of this is about 30 to 35 millimeters across, which is big for a finger. Um, but actually okay for the Allegro hand. And then we can also do um, uh, characterization of the stiffness matrix. And it turns out that the, uh, the theoretical prediction we got for this particular spring that we chose is actually quite close to the experimental fit. And I won't go through all these values, but down here in the bottom right, we see 4,000 uh, as our, uh, our element here in the stiffness matrix. And we had predicted 3,900. Okay, so um, that's the Visiflex. We're actually uh, in the process right now of putting, so the, the Allegro hand has four fingers. So we're putting this on the Allegro hand, all four of them on the Allegro hand, and just beginning experiments in multi-fingered regress manipulation. So um, I think I will wrap up here. Uh, and just say thanks to the people who contributed to the things I talked about today. Um, I did not talk about soft ground locomotion, uh, although that is something I'd love to hear more about when I, visit, uh, when I visit Dan's group later today. I also didn't talk about our swarm control project, but uh, my collaborators on the, on the mobile collaborative robots are Billy Strong and Matt Elwin. Uh, my student who just graduated who worked on contact juggling is Zach Woodruff. The FES Neuroprosthetic is kind of a big team between the Case Western Reserve, the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, and, and my center. And then the in-hand regrasp, um, Jian Shi, Juan Wang, and Tito Fernandez were the main contributors to that project. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and take any questions you might have. Thank you. All right, thanks, uh, thanks for that uh, very interesting talk. I, I, I love seeing the high level overview as well as the, the deeper part. So I want to introduce our um, panelists uh, who will be handling uh, questions in-house as well as on Zoom. We've got uh, Bibit Bianchini, who is uh, working with uh, Michael Poza. I think Michael Poza is here. Is he still here? Um, no, okay. Um, and she's you know, working on contact-aware controllers for manipulation. She's in her second year. Online, we've got uh, Andrew Spishin, who is uh, my PhD student, who should be graduating any minute now. And he's uh, working on uh, non prehensile manipulation. Great, thanks, Mark. So I'll start with one of my questions and then we'll eventually make our way around the room. So I wanna ask you about the, what you see as the trade-offs between pursuing biomimetic hardware and non-anthropomorphic things. And I know some of the biomimetic arguments are pretty strong where you can say evolution is doing the design work for you. But I'm curious what you see as the trade-offs here. Yeah, uh, good question. So, you know, biosystems is right there in the title of our center. So obviously we think that there's a lot to learn from a biological systems. And just to mention the other piece of that, part of the biosystems is, is using robots to interrogate biological systems. So, you know, um, building robot models of the biological system might actually help us learn about the biological system or even you know putting electrodes in the brains of rats you know that that kind of technology is helping us learn about the behavior of the biology not just build robots so we think it goes both ways uh, i personally do not like the word biomimetic you know as soon as i hear that my hairs go up a little bit um, i like bioinspired a lot I don't like biomimetic. So, I mean, there's a lot to learn from biological systems, but we're never trying to mimic them, right? Obviously biological systems have 
lots of other pressures and, and needs to be satisfied that robots do not. Um, but in terms of getting inspiration from them, you know, uh, I think there's a, a lot to be learned. Um, so I, I would just say bioinspired is good with me. Biomimetic makes me nervous. I will let Andrew go with a question next, and then I'll get some questions from the room. Okay, thank you, Vivit. Can, can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Great. Uh, so I'm going to uh, take a question from Dr. Kodacek. Uh, I'll, I'll read it verbatim, so for, forgive me for the lack of, uh, of expression if, if it comes across odd. Uh, so thanks for the wonderful talk and exciting work. It was noteworthy for the sliding regrass work that you didn't seem to need to worry about the reasoning with the uh, evil sick and slip models. How did you manage that? And what, how much prior information and calibration about the surface was required to get re reliable results? So I missed the, I think I missed the keyword, the evil what? Stick slip models. Evil stick slip models, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. So the theory that we developed that, you know, we were doing the motion planning with that I showed requires a very simple model, which is Coulomb friction, right? We do not believe that Coulomb friction applies in every case by, by any means. So. That's part of the reason that we wanna be able to do good feedback control. And that's part of the reason that we designed the new sensors. So the new sensors, are new, they're not just sensors, they're also an interface, they're compliant, right? So these tactile fingertips help us implement the plans that can be developed by a very strong assumption on the kinds of contact models. Um, but because they're providing continuous feedback we ex and they provide the compliance that we think we need, uh, we want to look beyond just those models to other sorts of reactive uh, contact control. Um, the other thing I'd say is you asked about how much calibration. So in the example that I showed, uh, we, did, we did learning, right? So, you know, everybody does learning these days. Uh, we very, in my group, we very rarely do sort of end-to-end -end black box learning, but we do do a lot of parameterized learning. And... Uh, even a better example was the um, functional electrical stimulation calibration or system ID that we did. So if you think about, you know, trying to understand how the, the stimulation that we provide to the muscles causes forces and torques at the arm, it's a very complex system, right? And so there are people out there who try to model the biomechanics, they'll tell you, all right, here's the physiological cross-section area of the muscle. Here are the insertion points. Here's its force length and velocity curves. And then, you know, one approach you could take is to try to fit all those parameters, right? So you know, move somebody's arm around while stimulating them, high dimensional space to try to fit all those parameters. That's impossible. Well, it's impossible for us, right? So when we're working with a person, you've got very real constraints, right? That person's only going to be comfortable to sit there for maybe an hour, right? So you sit down, you can do your calibration, and you need it to work after an hour. So this extremely high amount of data that's needed to provide a, a good fit over the entire possible workspace is not going to work with either a black box, you know, just a neural network or something, or with these high dimensional biological parameterizations. So what we do is we choose a, a very simple model. Like we know some things, we can measure the kinematics pretty well, right? So there's not nothing that we know, we know some things. And then we use very simple models and fit the parameters of those models. And that gets us maybe 70% of the performance. And then the last 20 or 30, we get by doing sort of black box residual fitting. So we very much believe in, you know, trying to use whatever information we have, whatever physics we know, to get as far as we can, fit parameters to take us a little bit further, and then use learning to try to cover the last bit. Um, so in the example that I showed you for the finger sliding down the object, we did spend some time sliding the fingers over the object to get an approximate estimate of the Coulomb friction coefficient. But that was the only parameter that we estimated. Well, that and also the stiffness. So we were planning for a particular active stiffness. We didn't quite get the same. So we, we estimated the active stiffness um, properties too. So those two 
where, where the sort of pre-learning bit, and then during the execution, we use those values. I don't know if that answers your question. I kind of went all over the place on that. But. I, I think that was a, a great approach to, to a, a lot of different paths that we could have gone with that. I, I want to maybe tease out a little bit more uh, if I could still steal Bibbit's opportunity to, to, for an audience question um, about that difference between modeling and learning. So you had mentioned that you don't like to do the end-to-end -end black box approach to learning, um, but there's a, a couple of questions from the audience um, and, and I myself have been wondering um, if you can maybe speak a little bit more about um, like maybe the importance of, of needing models when we're doing, or we're trying to find solutions to robotics problems. And um, I don't know, maybe if you wanna put a, a flag in the ground about like, where is there a line drawn for how far we should take uh, or trust learning? Yeah, that's, that's obviously a, a big topic and I won't be able to do it justice with my brief answer. But let me just say this, that um, one of the reasons that I like you know, using the physics and fitting parameters to those physics and taking that as far as you can is that those things we learn are usually very generalizable, right? Now I can use that same information in another task, right? Whereas if I am sort of like solving to say, throw an object into a bucket or something, and that's all I solve for, now what do I do if I, you know, throw it over there or something? And there's a lot of people interested in obviously cross-task generalization. For me, I think if we can, you know, the physics are cross-task, so we should take those as far as we can. Uh, and then, like I said, correct the bits that we don't know about that we're never gonna be able to model with any kind of accuracy. Um, but I just, I don't, I'm personally not a fan of starting from nothing uh, and then trying, unless we know nothing, which is usually not the case. So is that, is that I forget if that answers your question, but that, that's basically how I feel. Cross-task generalization, you get a lot from knowing something about the physics. And so you should use it when you have it. And if you don't have it, then, then you fall back to black box techniques. Excellent, thank you. I, I very much so appreciate your, uh, your perspective there. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Pivot for the next question. Thanks for the really cool talk. Um, I have a kind of detailed question. I noticed in the uh, finger design that like the, the stiffness matrix, like the, it's very like ellipsoidal and like the, it's not like a spherical stiffness. And I was curious if that was like a design constraint of the single spring or an intentional design based on differences in how you're gonna use that compliance. So very good question. Um, so the, you know, the, the one, the, the pieces with the angular components in the top left versus the linear components in the top right, unless you choose some scaling factor, uh, then they're gonna be different, right? But you could just look at say the bottom right, the, the linear component. And so for the example that I showed here, um, the fact that they're, they're different. So I think the bottom right one was half or less than half of the stiffness of the other two. And if you think about that, here's my helical spring. There's a direction in which it's made to comply. And then if I kind of slide it to the left, or, then it's gonna be much stiffer in those directions. So that's very much coming from the fact that we use the single helical spring. And if you saw that, uh, and we had another example there where we had three helical springs kind of come, and there now we can control the relative values of the X, Y, and Z stiffness. So yeah, it, it, you know, so we only have a few degrees of freedom in a helical spring, uh, basically. Um, you know, it very much depends on the application. Um, you know, for us, it's really the, it's really the normal stiffness, the kind of Z direction stiffness that matters the most. We don't, you know, as you're sliding a finger over an object, that's the direction you generally want it to comply. Whether it complies much in the tangential plane does not matter as much because friction is complying for us there, right? So if you, and this is one thing that we think about with this, this sliding regress problem is uh, we call it sticking sliding compliance or you know, spring sliding compliance, that's what we call it, right? Because you're getting this uh, possibly linear, like I showed there, possibly linear relationship between deflections and forces. And then in the tangential direction, you have this nonlinear damping where 
you know, essentially, you know, it doesn't slide at all. And then it starts sliding uh, with no, by the coolant model anyway, with no dependence on the sliding velocity. So it's kind of a, a together a nonlinear spring and damping compliance that we're getting at the fingertip. And both of them are important. But for us, for our examples, the tangential stiffness doesn't matter so much because we have that the sliding compliance. Andrew, we'll do one more in the room before you get your turn again. Thank you for the amazing talk. So I have a question about the collaboration robot. Um, so you commented that you need at least two robots to actually manipulate the object, right? But so, I, so I'm imagining that if you have some sort of damping and then if you flip it, it will not keep rotating, right? And so it's like, it's like allowing the object flowing in some sort of like viscous you know, fluid. So would that help with the manipulation or do you think that's not as good as, as what you guys do? Okay, so I thought I heard a couple of different things there. So one is the comment that we need at least three robots yeah. to control a rigid body. Yeah. And then the second one was sort of the control strategies for helping to manipulate an object. So, yeah, right. so yeah, the, at least three is just a, you know, it's just a mechanical thing. It's, that's just the way we designed it. We designed these robots to be collaborative. We didn't want you might have seen humans and robots carrying together a table or something before. That robot could control all the degrees of freedom of the table if it wanted. We designed these specifically so they couldn't, they had to work together. Oh, so that, that's one thing. But then in terms of the control methodology, there's lots of things you could do with these robots. So the simplest thing, the thing I showed here that can be accomplished without any communication between the robots is basically canceling gravity. And that, that does a lot for us, right? I mean. Now, gravity constrains lots of things that we do. So we get rid of that, and now the human can kind of manipulate the object very easily. There's a little bit more going on there. There's, there's some static friction too, so that the human kind of stops it, it will stay there. And then you have to overcome that static friction to start moving again. So it's, it's a little bit more than just canceling gravity. But when you can do robot to robot communication, then there's lots of things you could do. You could implement, you know, virtual constraints. You could, you know, you can implement a viscous flow field or something. I mean, there's lots of things that could be done. So we're just at the beginning of this project, really. We are sort of have a proof of concept that the hardware does what we want it to do. And now we've got lots of directions that we can go. And I didn't talk about it in this project, but a bit in this talk, but a big part of what we do is multi-robot communication, decentralized control, optimization, and estimation. And now we can take those things and apply it to a, uh, you know, distributed manipulation problem. So that's something we're looking forward to. But what we showed, what I showed there is really just kind of a proof of concept that we can decouple this kind of crappy motion control from pretty good force control. And then that gives us a lot. Okay, so, thank you. Yep. Yep. Andrew, go ahead with a virtual question. Do we have a, a question about the Visiflex sensor? Uh, the question is, can it be scaled up to handle the kind of impact, high impact forces that you would see in legged locomotion uh, in the toe and what challenges might be needed to, to be overcome in that task? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, you know, what we've done is pretty simple. So uh, you probably don't need me to opine on it. What we've done is we've taken a, uh, a spring and shown that we can measure this displacement and get six degree to wrenches, six degree frame wrenches. Um, so yeah, obviously you could do the same thing. If you're building compliance into your leg, then you could perhaps measure the displacement of the foot relative to some proximal link and then figure out what the forces and torques that are being applied to it. And since you're building in the spring anyway, maybe you can do that. But I'm not, I'm not, I don't know that that's the best approach. I mean, all we're really showing is that we have visible displacements because we want visible displacements. We want real compliance at the contacts. And if you've got visible displacements, why not use that cheap, you know, well-packaged sensor to get not only the contact locations, but to get that six degree of freedom displacement and get a wrench from that. So yeah, I think it can be done, but obviously the how you do it is what matters. If I could follow up with, um... So I, I appreciate your slide uh, that sort of, sort of the, the, the literature review, the history of, of these types of sensors. And um, so the, they've been designed, and I was surprised to see as, as far back as, as 1990s, if, if that was the date. But um, uh, 
what's the application? Uh, is it an application push or pull in robotics to be using these sen sensors? I mean, your your motivation is to to solve this spatial um, reed rasping problem, which is is like a really exciting, difficult um, theoretical problem. But um, yeah, is there is there like a, a killer application for for these sensors? Uh, that's a good question. You know, we there are people commercializing these sensors, obviously, and gel site slash digit from Facebook is one of the most prominent ones, and there are others out there. Um, so uh, if you make them cheap enough, which I think Facebook has them down to $300 a fingertip, whereas the, the biotechs that we have cost more than $5,000 each when we bought them. So if you make them inexpensive enough, then maybe you find the applications, right? People say, oh, let me, let me give this a shot. Uh, as of right now, I don't know what the killer application is. Uh, we're also not, we also don't have a company, nor do we have plans. Um, in our case, we just built it because what we wanted was wrenches, we wanted compliance, we wanted contact locations. And the things that were available were, were, not, were not meeting that. Desire. Also, we wanted a, a rounded surface because we want, we're interested in rolling as well as sliding contact. So short answer is, I don't know what the killer app is. Uh, if I did, maybe I would be starting a company. Excellent, thank you for your answer. Um, I had a sort of equally high level question, but more about the related to the Omnid project. Um, I think I'm also really interested in these sort of physical human robot collaborative manipulation type scenarios. Um, and I, you know, you put some some future work up about your specific system, but I'm curious on a broader level, what you see as the most pressing problems in this space of, um, I guess I'm really interested in sort of the human sensing side, um, not just sort of high level cognitive intent inference, but also physiologically. And so I'm curious, you know, you've presented a lot of projects in that space as well, where you see those connections or sort of the big outstanding problems in the literature there. Um. Yeah, so <laughs> again, I don't think I'll be able to give a great answer in a short period. It was a pretty broad question. I think, what are the big questions in human robot well, so, You know, this human robot collaborative manipulation scenario, you built a system that does sort of gravity compensation yep. that allows, you know, that level of the human is driving, you know, driving the system, but the robots are, um, are you know, just performing this one particular task related to it. Um, yep. Whereas then, you know, you also, you then sort of jumped that from there to autonomous, fully autonomous manipulation. And I'm curious, you know, in that spectrum, um, beyond just gravity compensation, mm -hmm. whether there are problems that you see as particularly pressing or interesting. Well, I think, yeah. So, I mean, there are a lot of domains. So what I, what I showed here, I mean, first thing you should say is, oh, look, he's got mechanum wheels. So it's never going to be anywhere off of nice smooth floors. Right. So, I mean, that's part of the reason that, uh, you know, when, when I tell you, I mean, hopefully you believe me. If you don't, that's fine. Uh, maybe I'll convince you in the future. Uh, I'd like to think of the mobility part as being decoupled from the manipulation part, right? So the mobility part is just kind of giving us gross motion and it doesn't need to, it has to be able to recenter the manipulator. So the manipulator can do what it does. Um, but so forgetting for the moment or allowing me to pretend that mechanum wheels are not the only way that this can be implemented. I think you can see uh, examples in construction, uh, you know, where, um, you know, you're assembling an I-beam or something and fully automating something. So another thing people say is, well, wait, you know, I could do, I could automate all of that. Sure, in a factory, maybe you could. We're interested in cases where, you know, it's a one-off task, you know, you're repairing the, the solar panel on the Mars habitat or something, right? And so we're interested in cases where it's not highly engineered to be done thousands of times and um, kind of unstructured, uh, things like uh, const maybe construction site, maybe in a warehouse moving, you know, large objects around, uh, things where you don't have, you're not able to engineer a system to do it over and over and over. So again, interested in manipulator assistance thinking about what capability, what minimum capabilities they have to have to be useful. And that's what we try to demonstrate here. Sort of a minimum capability is that they can sort of cancel the weight of the object. But now if you wanna do something, you know, more, uh, more complicated, 
Maybe they need to estimate where the person is grabbing the object or what their intent is, or maybe there's other communication. We think about the communication that we're interested in is physical, right? If I push on the object, that's gonna be sensed by the robot, right? So there's a lot of information passing around physically. And this is why I think if you gave me a, a joystick or a space ball or something and told me to in, manipulate the six degree of freedom object without touching it, I think you lose a ton of information, right? We haven't done the experiments yet, but that's what we wanna do is have people kind of play a game where they manipulate the object versus contacting it. And that sort of high bandwidth feedback you can't get without the physical contact. So we're interested in things like construction, warehouse, uh, maybe assembly of aircraft wings, things like that where you don't do it all the time and having a person physically involved would be a useful thing. Thank you, everyone. Let's uh, thank the speaker one more time. Thank you.